Praise the Lord, River City Pentecostals family and friends. Such a good day to be alive and in God's service. This is the day that the Lord has made. So we need to make the choice to rejoice and be glad in it because God has purpose and design in this day. Our lesson today is one that, well, when we first come to God, it's almost the first lesson that we learn, that God begins to restore us. God begins to restore what the enemy took from us. And understand that God does judge rebellion. He does judge sin. And though God judges rebellion and sin, we can still find restoration if we turn to Him. I know we can find strength in this promise, and it is the title of our lesson today. God will restore. Our lesson text today comes from the book of Zephaniah, the third chapter, the eighth through the thirteenth verse. The word of the Lord tells us that, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Also within our text, the book of Acts, the second chapter, starting at the first verse and going through verse 4. The word of the Lord says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Their family car was a 1970 lime green Ford Falcon XA Superbird. Tommy and his mom and dad loved that car. They drove everywhere in that car. Until, one night, Tommy's dad lost control and rolled the car into a ditch not far from their family farm. Since he did not have insurance, he left it on the farm, sitting right where he wrecked it. And there, it remained for the next 40 years. Until one day, Tommy decided to have the former family car completely restored. Parts were rare and expensive. So was labor. In 2017, few knew how to restore a 1970 Ford Falcon to its former glory. But Tommy found a dynamic duo of mechanics willing to take on the task. They worked for months. Shipping the car from one shop to another. Shopping for one part after another. Doubtless. There were days when the project seemed like it would stall, and Tommy and his team kept shipping, shopping, looking, buying, working, and restoring. Until after several months and $71,000, 
the shop called Tommy to let him know his car was restored and it was ready. He drove it to his parents' house. His dad walked out of the house and wept when he saw his once crumpled, wrecked, and left to rust Ford Falcon sitting in his driveway, fully restored. For one fleeting minute, he was different. He was newly married again. He was young again. He was what he once was before the wreck. Restoration did that for him. Restoration did that for them. Uh, So pull your chair a little bit closer and let's listen as a short-winded prophet named Zephaniah tells the story of God restoring his people to what they once were before the wreck. It's a heartwarming story of mercy, of redemption, and of course, of restoration. You see, it has become almost a platitude to observe that we live in a hurting world. However, the distinctive is that much of this hurt is largely invisible to the physical eye. We have advanced by leaps and bounds in our ability to deal with physical brokenness, crippling disease, and the like, uh, while simultaneously regressing, it seems, in our ability to care for the inner man, the inner spiritual and mental lives of mankind. That several recent outbreaks of violence have been increasingly linked to various forms of mental disorder is surely an eloquent, if not disturbing, testimony to the fact that we have forgotten something. What our world needs more than ever before is restoration. It's a topic that occupies a central place in the message that the prophet Zephaniah brought to God's people. Now, the prophet Zephaniah, he ministered at a particular moment in the history of the nation of Israel. It was a peculiar time. You see, the reign of Josiah marked a high point in late Judean history. In fact, the writer of Kings offered this summary evaluation. He walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. It is perhaps not too great an exaggeration to say that Josiah was more righteous than David, given that David had the great sins in the matter of Bathsheba and Uriah. What is easy to miss in the glory of Josiah's latter reforms is the inauspicious beginnings of his reign. You see, Josiah assumed the throne at the tender age of eight, succeeding his wicked father, Amon, and his grandfather, Manasseh, who led the kingdom of Judah into a moral and spiritual degradation that rivaled and even surpassed the final, the, uh, well, the fallen kingdom of Israel. In fact, in the previous chapter, the writer of Kings summarized Manasseh's reign this way. Manasseh seduced them, the Judeans, to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. For over 50 years, Judah had lived a more wicked and defiled life than the ancient Canaanites. When Josiah first assumed the throne, the nation continued on this self-destructive path. In fact, it really wasn't until Josiah's 18th year that the lost copy of the book of the law was discovered in the temple. This changed everything. For an entire decade, Josiah followed in the path of his wicked ancestors. The burning question then of Josiah's reign is, what changed? What changed in his life? Of course, the writer of Kings pointed to the rediscovery of the book of the law. However, Josiah would have never discovered the book of the law if he had not first undertaken the repair and purification of the temple. So what what event sparked that desire in Josiah's heart to see that repair? The answer, it seems, was, well, at least in part, it was the prophetic ministry of Zephaniah. Zephaniah came thundering, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. 
Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. This may be the real significance of the tracing of Zephaniah's family all the way back to King Hezekiah. Not only does it appear to suggest that Zephaniah, the prophet, was of royal lineage, but it also linked his prophecy to the leader of the last great royal revival in Judean history, a king whose righteousness was also depicted in terms of comparison to King David in 2 Kings, the 18th chapter, the third verse. Zephaniah, the prophet, was consumed with the coming day of the Lord. He mentioned it more than any other prophet. He provided two different images to help his listeners and, and to us also to help them understand and us to understand the importance of this event, the day of the Lord at the end of history. In Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 8, the prophet called it the day of the Lord's sacrifice. Here, Zephaniah echoed the language of the prophet Hosea, evoking the imagery of a religious, solemn assembly. Zephaniah, however, also named this coming day as a day of the trumpet and alarm, describing it as a martial term of divine inv in invasion. Such a divine onslaught was irresistible. It's inescapable. In the prophetic view, the day of the Lord had two interlocking purposes. Number one, to purify the earth of all unrighteousness. And number two, to bring about Jehovah's universal rule of justice and righteousness. Now, though Zephaniah made clear in the opening verses that this day is universal in its scope, his first pronouncements of judgment were specifically applied to the land of Judah, at the core of God's judgment of his own people was their worship of false gods and the rejection of God and God's will, even in the way that they dressed. This simultaneous turning to other gods and turning away from the one true God had led to a corrupted, immoral society filled with violence and oppression. The people the people began to lie to themselves. They said the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. They had convinced themselves that Jehovah was either too big to notice their uh, alliances with other gods, or he was too weak to really stop them. They painted Jehovah as an uncaring, blind, and helpless deity, just like the false gods of the surrounding nations. Thus, the first purpose of divine judgment was to correct the chosen people's misperceptions of God and His purposes in the world. In Zephaniah, the second chapter, the fourth through the fifteenth verse, the scope of the prophet's vision extended to the nations. First, those that neighbor Judah and Moab and Ammon to the east and others, and then to the Mediterranean basin or the sea coast, and finally, Ethiopia and Assyria. Mark Boda suggests that Ethiopia may very well have been a cipher for the nation of Egypt. Clearly, the mentioned nations are historic enemies of God's people, punished for their oppression and persecution of God's chosen people. However, these negative actions towards God's people were rooted in a much deeper issue. This shall they have for their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. Time and again, Scripture condemns the folly of human hubris. At its most basic, pride is the misappropriation of divine rights by finite humans. In these nations' actions against Israel, they attempted to assert their will for dominance and power. And this act of self-assertion did not end 
with international dominance in one of the most astounding passages in the book of Zephaniah. The prophet described the coming days of Assyria's ancient capital, Nineveh, and the judgment that was to come upon Nineveh. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like a wilderness, and flocks shall lie down in the midst of her, all the beasts of the nations, both the cormorant and the bittern, shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How has she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in? Everyone that passeth by her shall hiss and wag his hand. The words of the city were an almost direct quotation of Jehovah's own words to the prophet Isaiah. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. Now, even more breathtaking, the city of Nineveh co-opted the divine name, I am, for herself. Jehovah, therefore, must take action against this brazen self-exaltation in order to protect the honor of his own name. The book of Zephaniah shows us important things about the nature of the coming judgment, lessons that should still apply to us today. First, first and foremost, this judgment will be universal. This is a key part of what makes divine judgment a just judgment. Everyone will be held accountable. Everybody is going to be on the same plane. Secondly, the coming judgment is God's action against human pride and rebellion that attempts to assert an alternative to divine dominion. It is not that God is somehow personally threatened by human attempts to exercise autonomy. God's not threatened by that. Rather, the issue is that as the creator of the world, only God has the requisite power, the wisdom, and understanding to orchestrate his creation. God must remain sovereign over the world. So, and, and I think this is important. So it continues to operate in the ways that allow us to flourish. At every turn, God works to defeat and deter human pride because he is trying to protect us, not because he's trying to protect himself. Finally, divine judgment is the root of divine restoration. There is no offer of salvation available in Scripture that does not begin with repentance. Unless and until we grasp the depth and the breadth of God's judgment, we will be unable to appreciate the glorious hope He has promised to those who will turn their lives over to Him. God will restore. If the book of Zephaniah was breathtaking in its depiction of the universal scope of the meaning of judgment, it's really no less astonishing in its sudden turn toward promises of restoration in the final chapter. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Perhaps the most astonishing feature is the universal nature of these promises. All the earth will be devoured by the divine fire of judgment so that all the earth can come to know and serve the Lord. Just as the promises of judgment opened with a universal perspective, so now the promises of restoration adopt that same point of view. It's to all. This final oracle also revealed that God's judgment had a purifying intent. In that future day, pride, iniquity, deceit, and violence would all be purged from the nation. 
Instead, humility, righteousness, and peace would characterize the city of Jerusalem and the people of God. Finally, the signal of this coming day is that God would change the speech of the peoples into pure speech, that all of them will call on the name of the Lord and will serve Him as one. This prophecy was spectacularly fulfilled centuries later on the day of Pentecost when about 120 were gathered in the upper room and they began to speak with other tongues as that Spirit of God in them began to give the utterance. The crowd bears witness to the purity of this Spirit-enabled speech. They, They began to exclaim, We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. For Peter, the outpouring of the Spirit was, first and foremost, a sign of the last days foretold by the prophet Joel. Admittedly, it is tempting to ignore this end times aspect in our theology of spirit baptism. What we tend to focus on is the Spirit's empowerment for us to be a witness or to give us victory over sin, or to help us be overcomers. These are all realities that we experience day to day. We experience those realities now. We enjoy the powerful demonstrations of the charismatic gifts, miraculous healings, messages given in tongues with interpretation, dynamic words of wisdom and or knowledge. But the Spirit is not given simply to enable us to live an overcoming life here and now. It is also given to inspire us with hope for the future. The Apostle Paul called the baptism of the Spirit the earnest of our inheritance. It's a mere down payment on glories that have yet to be revealed in us. The Spirit is not given just simply to satisfy us, but to tantalize us with glimpses of a world that has yet to be revealed. And what does Zephaniah say will be the crucial difference between this present world and the world that's yet to come? The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. That time I will undo all that afflict thee. And I will save her that halteth, and gathereth, and gather her that was driven out. And I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. When we speak of the end time restoration, we are speaking of more than simply an idyllic period of time and a perfect peace and harmony in, in history or a time that's yet to come. The coming perfection will only be possible because God will once again fully dwell with humanity. John's last vision opened with the triumphant cry, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with them, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. The amazing truth is that even now, in this present imperfect world, we can experience, at least in part, that coming restoration if we will only repent and turn to the Lord, as Zephaniah encouraged the Judeans to do. Remember that Zephaniah's message probably played a key role in turning the heart of King Josiah to the Lord. Thus, the ancient story of Josiah's revival, it's a testimony of God's graciousness to those who repent today. No matter how wicked the world in which we live becomes, God has the ability to renew and to restore His people. We all know, we're very aware that we live in a broken world, and this world is full of broken people. Everyone, including those in the church, everyone deals daily with the after effects of brokenness. Dysfunctional families, ruptured relationships, unjust circumstances. We all long for final and full restoration. So where do we begin 
such a process? What, what is the initial step toward whole, wholeness? Um, from a biblical perspective, the journey begins with the arrival of God's divine presence. It's only through the gift of the Holy Ghost that the restoring power of God will one day reshape this entire world. And that restoration is available to each one of us today. I've always heard that when you look at the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and we know that all three of these are one in Jesus, that there's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We, we understand that. But that one true God was the Father in creation. That one true God robed himself in flesh, became the man Christ Jesus, gave himself as a sinless sacrifice to be redemption in the Son. And then he poured out his spirit into man on the day of Pentecost so he could be regeneration or restoration and renewing through the Holy Ghost. Today, through the Holy Ghost, we have the opportunity to have restoration in our lives. And that restoration begins the day that you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But it doesn't stop there. If we would repent from our failings, from our shortcomings, if we would repent from following after the flesh or after the things that displease God, that Spirit, the Spirit of God in you, it will once again restore. I am thankful that I serve a God that through His grace, He will restore me. Let's be reminded of that today. God bless you, RCP. I love you all. I hope that you have had a great new year. And I hope that I see you all in service, either at our 10 a.m. or our 12.30 p.m. service. God's going to do great things this year. I believe it. God bless you all. I love you.